You're very welcome to our Easter Sunday service broadcast, and we are going to come to God's Word today, and we're going to think about the resurrection of Christ and what that means to us. We're reading from the book of Matthew, chapter 28, and the verse number 1. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulchre. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him. Lo, I have told you. And they departed quickly from the sepulchre with fear and great joy, and did run to bring his disciples' word. Amen. We know that God will add his own blessing to the reading of his inspired and infallible word. Let us seek the Lord for prayer. Father in heaven, we come into thy holy presence in the name of our Savior. We thank that we can gather for prayer, we can gather for reading the Scriptures, and we can gather to think about your Word. And although we miss uh, not being able to come as a church into your house, yet we rejoice that in our homes and amongst our families we can, count, we can congregate together to listen to what you are saying to us. And we pray that these days would quickly pass, and we pray that we'll be able to come to your church again. But until that day comes, give us your grace, give us your strength, as we know you are doing. We pray for all who suffer again that you would be with them. We pray for the medical profession that you will bless them. We pray for those who suffer physically, those who have suffered financially, we commit them to you as well. And we pray that there would be help for each one in the Savior's name. We thank you for this Easter season when we can reflect upon Jesus Christ and his death and resurrection. But we thank you for the first day of the week on this day when we remember every day, every Sabbath throughout the year, every New Testament Sabbath throughout the year on this first day of the week. We remember and rejoice in the fact that Christ is alive. Be with us today as we meditate upon this great fact of history. Father, I pray the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart would be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Amen and amen. We are going to think about the verse 6 of Matthew chapter 28 today, where the angels said to the woman who came to the sepulchre very early in the morning on the first day of the week, they said, come, see the place where the Lord lay. As we trace the life of our Savior, his earthly sojourn, there are certain locations which are very special. There is, Be there, there is Bethlehem, where he was born of a virgin. Uh, there is Nazareth, where he grew up with Joseph and Mary. There is the River Jordan, where he was baptized by John the Baptist. There is the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee is a tremendous scene in the life and ministry of Christ. By its shore, he called its fishermen to be disciples. He walked on top of its waters, and he sailed its waves. The area around Galilee saw some of his most notable miracles. Jairus' daughter, that little girl who had died at Capernaum, was raised again. The madman of Gadara crossed the sea from the other side of Capernaum. That man who had been possessed of those demons was set free by the power of Christ. And then on a hillside overlooking the Sea of Galilee, he preached to the multitudes. He produced his marvelous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. And in another place, perhaps not so very far away, he fed the 5,000 out of that little boy's lunch. The Lord did things that amazed people. He said things that astonished people. He said it all in the vicinity of Galilee. And then we travel south, and we come to old Jerusalem. 
the places where he frequented within those wall, the places where he frequented within those old and famous walls are now by and large no more. The temple where he cast the money changers out, the temple where he confounded the confounded the doctors of the Old Testament law at twelve years of age, that temple has now been virtually obliterated. There's hardly a trace of it left behind. He once went in between the huge columns teaching the people as he went confronting the Pharisees and Sadducees as he walked. But that temple was destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD. But the Mount of Olives still stands. That mount overlooking the old city of Jerusalem where he taught his disciples about the end times. Garden of Gethsemane is still there. That place where he agonized on the eve of his sufferings. Another place that still stands is Calvary, the skull-shaped hill where he was crucified. There are few places more special to the Christian than this place, Calvary. We often talk about Calvary as we preach the gospel, that hill just outside the city wall where Jesus died for me and where Jesus died for you. But there is one place that is more special that is more special still and that place may actually still be in existence today many believe that it is and some have seen it as they have visited old jerusalem and that place is the empty tomb that place that was vacated on the morning of the first day of the week and let us hear the invitation that comes from the angels, the angels who spoke to these women out of devotion, they came to his grave just after he had died. And the angels, they said, the stone was rolled away, come see the place where the Lord lay. Let us think about the empty tomb today. In the first place, let us contemplate the invitation to the empty tomb. I have stood at the graves of great men. I have stood at C.H. Spurgeon's grave, Norwood Cemetery in London. And it's a stirring place because you think of the man whose bones were laid into this place, the souls he led to the Lord, the testimony that he left behind. I stood at John Bunyan's grave in London. And what a place that is to think of the work that that man did, particularly the Pilgrim's Progress that he wrote, but other great writings that have left their mark upon subsequent generations of Christians. And across the road from Bunyan's grave is John Wesley's grave, a great soul winner of another generation. There are other graves I would love to visit. Someday I hope to walk through Westminster Abbey and view the resting places of the kings and queens of the great and good in our history. But here we are invited to come to the grave of one who truly is the greatest and the best. We're coming to the grave of the greatest man who ever lived. It is one thing to stand at the grave of a, a great person, a famous person. But it is another thing to stand at the grave of a loved one the grave of a dear friend. Many will flock to famous graves, graves of famous people, but there are other graves that are not well known. There are other graves that may be in some forlorn corner of a cemetery somewhere that few will ever visit, but there will be one that will come. There will be one that will come with a, a tear in the eye, with a heaviness in the footstep, because that Grave represents precious memories. A loved one that has been taken. The years have slipped by and still that grave has the power to stir up the memory and the sorrow because that grave holds the remains of a loved one. And whenever we're invited to come to the empty tomb of the Lord Jesus Christ, yes, he is great in so many ways but he is our friend. He is our best friend. He is the friend of sinners without whom we could not be in glory, 
the one who came to live and to die for us. The angels, they beckon us to come. The women are weeping. They are coming with sorrow. We are told in Matthew 28 and the verse 1, dawn was breaking. Mary Magdalene, she is there. The other Mary is there. They're coming to see the sepulcher. And there was a great earthquake. The stone has been rolled back. Their sorrow has now been turned into fear because they're seeing an angel. They're seeing something amazing. They're not meeting what they expected to meet. And the angel says to them in verse 5, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus which was crucified. Don't be afraid. He's not here. He is risen. Come see the place where the Lord lay. They're speaking to sorrowing women. They're speaking to fearful women. And they're saying, come. Today we live in a time of sorrow and a time of fear. But yet we hear the invitation. Come to this place of hope. Come see the place where the Lord lay. You see, the angel is beckoning the woman to come. Because the angel knows that something amazing has happened. The most pivotal moment in human history has arrived. There's something about this sacred spot. There's no smell of death. There's no smell of death. Because Christ's body never experienced corruption. His Holy One could not see corruption. Yes, he died, but death did not corrupt that very special body. Death never absolutely triumphed over him. He willingly succumbed to death. He chose to die. He bowed his head. He gave up the ghost. But death was a vanquished foe. The angels, they realized this. He rose again. He came forth from that grave. And they're saying, come. Here your fears will be removed. Here you will be comforted as you can be comforted nowhere else. Come, see the place where the Lord lay. But as we come, it is a quiet spot. This is early in the morning. They're coming alone. And they are saying, come to this quiet tomb. Come to this quiet grave. Come and reflect upon what has happened. There were so many things in their mind. But the angel was saying, be still and know that God is God. Sense the peace in your hearts today. There are so many things upon our minds. There's so much trouble and so much pain in the world. But let us come to this quiet place. Let us be still in our hearts and be calm in our souls and let us reflect upon this fact, the greatest fact in human history. Let us receive this invitation and accept it and come. See the place where the Lord lay. He's not there now. He's not lying there now. He lay there, but it's an empty tomb. And so we have the invitation to the empty tomb first of all but let's also think about the attention at the empty tomb as we look at this tomb as we think about this tomb what facts come to our mind this is a very costly tomb it belonged to a rich man it was the tomb that belonged to joseph of arimathea and he was a member of the jewish sanhedrin he was a ruler amongst the jews this tomb had never been used before. He had carved it out of the rock. He had paid for this tomb to be placed here, to be chiseled out for himself and for his family. It would have cost him a lot of money. And here was the Lord Jesus Christ being laid to rest in a rich man's tomb. Oh, he was poor throughout his life, physically poor, and yet in death, he was in a rich man's tomb. And this corresponds with Isaiah chapter 53 and the verse 9. Where we read that he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. He died with wicked men. He died with thieves. He died the death of a murderer. But he was laid in the tomb of a rich man. And of course, that reflects upon who he was. King of kings and Lord of lords. But this wasn't just a costly tomb. It was a borrowed tomb. 
He only borrowed the tomb. He would be laid within this tomb and then he would rise again. His body would not remain here forever only for a few days, a few hours. Really, it was borrowed. But he had to borrow the tomb. This tomb was not his own because death ultimately was not going to have the victory over him. But yet there was a humiliation here in that he was buried in another man's tomb. And this was just an added humiliation to the many humiliations that he had experienced throughout his life as he, the Son of God, humbled himself, becoming obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. But as we look at this tomb again, yes, it was a costly tomb, it was a borrowed tomb, but this tomb was cut out of the rock. It was a tomb chiseled out of the side of a hill. The rock was broken in order that the tomb might be created. And inside this rock was laid the one who is called the Rock of Ages. That tomb consisted of rock that was broken. And he, the Rock of Ages, was broken on the cross in order that we might have eternal life. We are told in the Old Testament that whenever the children of Israel they required water, God told Moses to smite the rock and Moses smote the rock and water flowed from the rock. Water gushed out of the rock. I can imagine a great torrent, a magnificent waterfall breaking forth from that rock in order that the people's thirst might be quenched. The Lord Jesus Christ was the rock that was smitten. The rock that was broken on the cross that we might receive the water of eternal life. It was Augustus Top Lady who wrote, Rock of ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy riven side which flowed be of sin. The double cure cleanse me from its guilt and power. And the Lord was buried in this tomb. So this tomb... It belonged to a rich man. This tomb was borrowed. This tomb was chiseled out of the rock, but the Lord was actually buried in this tomb. And that represents something so very special for the children of God. As he was buried, so our sins were buried. Our sins were put away. There is no guilt for the child of God because Christ has taken that guilt. He has faced the consequences that our sin deserves. And as he was buried, our sins were buried with them. How do I know that I have peace with God? Because my sins were buried with Christ. Living, he loved me. Dying, he saved me. Buried, he carried my sins far away. And this tomb was a new tomb. Something else grasps our attention at this empty tomb it was a new tomb no death had ever been there he was conceived in the womb of a virgin represented his absolute purity as he came into this world but as he died he was buried in a virgin tomb no death had been here emphasizing again that death was never going to have dominion over our precious jesus and so we observe two things. We have the invitation to this empty tomb, the attention at the empty tomb. But let's also think about the emotion in the empty tomb. We're in this empty tomb now. We come with these women. We come to this place where the Lord lay. There are two emotions that will come upon us, and let's pray they do come upon us today in tandem. There is sorrow. It must be a very sorrowful thing to stand at the grave of one who is a dear, precious friend. A loved one who has been taken. The grave is a place of weeping and sorrow and tears and heartbrokenness. But let us stand in this empty tomb today and let us mourn over the sufferings of Christ. The sufferings of Christ that brought our dear Savior from heaven's glory into this world. To be laid in this tomb. Why did he die? 
Why did he have to be buried in this place? Why? It was for me. My sins drove the nails through his hands and through his feet. My sin hammered the thorns into his brow. My sin caused him to cry, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? It was my sin and it was your sin. If it were not for our sins, he would not have experienced all of this. We were the guilty party. It was not merely the Jews who said, Away with him, crucify him. It was not merely Pilate who sent him away to his death, even though he knew he was a just man. It was not just the soldiers who sat at the foot of the cross and gambled over his garments. It was not just the people who with cold, callous hearts watched him die. It was you and it was me. It was your sin, it was my sin. Let us pray that God would move upon our hearts so we would mourn over our sins that caused Christ to come to suffer in such a way. But there isn't just the emotion of sorrow. There has to be the emotion of joy. This is a place of tears, but it is also a place of gladness. Because this tomb is empty. Society today needs hope. But where is our hope? So much is talked about in relation to hope. In the midst of all of the fear, all of the suffering, COVID-19, what it's bringing to this world, people are trying to cling to hope. Is there hope in humanity? Humanity is a dying race, a depraved race. Is there hope in science? Science is struggling to keep up with the pace of this pandemic. COVID-19 is a sad reminder that we are living in a broken world. And after COVID-19, there will be more sadness, there will be more disease, there will be more wars, there will be more famines, there will be more natural disasters, there will be more accidents. Because we live in a world where we are constantly under the shadow of death. Where is our hope in this world of death? It isn't Christ and Christ alone. If there is no Christ who died and rose again, there is no hope. He alone, and listen to me today, He alone has defeated death. He alone gives us hope. The Muslims cannot say, come to this empty tomb. Muhammad is dead. And Buddha is dead. The holy men of Hinduism are dead. Joseph Smith, the founder of Mormonism, is dead. Every cult leader, every religious leader who has led the people in a way that is contrary to the Christ of this book is dead. But only Christianity can invite us into an empty tomb because Jesus Christ lives. Secular humanism dominates the agenda in Western democracy. But what good is secular humanism now? Men and women are dying. Men and women are suffering. What hope can atheism provide now? Atheism says, humanism says, secular humanism says that we came from nothing. By pure random forces we are here. We are going over. Yet a little bit in between is of somehow marvelous importance. And yet in the midst of it all we're struggling and we're weeping and we're mourning. And there's so much darkness all around us. What kind of a message is that? Christianity says that we came from God. God has created us. God has placed us here. Placed us here for the glory of God. We are a dying people on account of our sinfulness and wickedness, but there is a way back to God from the dark paths of sin. And Christ is at the heart of this way back to God. And he died for us that we might know peace in this world of death, that we might have hope. He rose again. Here is our only hope in a hopeless world. Here is peace amidst the unrest. Without Christ, our souls are lost. Oh, may our hearts be stirred, excited, with both tears and gladness as we come to this empty tomb. But fourthly and finally, I want you to think about the instruction from the empty tomb. There are three simple lessons that come to us in closing from this empty tomb. There is the divinity of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is God. He made the worlds. Without him wasn't anything made that was made. 
We do not see him impaled upon a cross. We see him as the Prince of Glory, as the Son of God. He is God incarnate, human flesh. What a privileged world this is. That Jesus Christ came into this world. That he walked this world. That he came in the form of a man. He took upon himself the very likeness of sinful flesh. He took upon himself the likeness of the very creatures that had rebelled against him. And he became the sinless man. The only sinless man who ever lived. And we have the records. We have the facts. Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. We have these inspired records of the life of Christ. The Son of God. What a privileged world this is. What a privileged people we are that we have the scriptures, that we have this light that has been given to us. Another instruction we receive from this empty tomb is this, that the debt of sin is paid in full. We owe God a debt. If you're watching this today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're in debt to God. You owe God a perfect life but you cannot pay that debt. And because you cannot pay that debt, God will extract the price from you. And that's why there's a place called hell where sinners are punished forever because they've broken the law of God. But on the cross, Jesus paid the debt. He suffered the wrath of God for every one of our sins in order that we might have peace with God forever in order that we might be reconciled with God. And how do we know that the debt has been paid because Jesus Christ lives? And God raised him from the grave because God accepted the price that was paid on the cross, accepted the satisfaction procured through the precious blood. God accepted redemption. Therefore, Christ was delivered for our offenses and raised again for our justification as Paul wrote in Romans 4, 25. Can you know today, dear unsaved friend, that you can be saved if you trust Christ as your Savior? Yes, you can know, because Jesus Christ lives. That is the guarantee of your forgiveness. And one third lesson we get from this empty tomb, one third note of instruction, that there will be a resurrection in the future, that all of God's people will be raised again. You see, this resurrection of Christ, this empty tomb, speaks of other tombs and other graves that are going to be emptied. The Lord Jesus Christ is described by the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 as being the first fruits of them that slept. Some people are out in the gardens this weather. The weather has been good. And so many are confined at home. People are getting out to the garden. They're planting seeds. Whenever the seeds are planted, we wait for the seedlings to spring up. Whenever the seedlings spring up, our hearts feel quite glad. There's something uplifting about that. There's life. But as soon as the first seedlings begin to appear, we know that the harvest will be good. There will be others coming. And the Lord Jesus Christ, he vacated at the tomb. He is the first fruits of them that slept. He is the guarantee that by his resurrection, all of his people will be raised again at that great moment in history that is yet to come. His second coming. Yes, he's coming again. He rose again in order that he might come again back to this world. And that day is coming. And it's coming quicker and it's coming quicker. He's coming quickly. That's what the end of the book of Revelation teaches. Surely I come quickly. The apostle John, he prayed the last prayer of the Bible. Even so come Lord Jesus. And when he comes, we're told that those that are alive and remain upon the world... They will be changed in an instant, transformed in the twinkling of an eye. They'll be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. But we're also told that the dead in Christ shall rise first. Those in the graves for decades, for centuries, for millennia, they'll be brought together. The cells will be fused together again. And all of God's people will be gathered as one mighty host. And they will ascend to meet the Lord in the air. That will be a great day of uniting God's people getting together, families being reunited in Christ. What a day that's going to be. The resurrection morning. And there will be no sin and there will be no disease. And there will be no viruses. And there will be no wars and no famines. There will be no curse and no death. The former things will have passed away. And so we shall be forever with the Lord. 
But the fact that this tomb is empty teaches that he's coming again for his people, but it also teaches that he's coming again as judge. Yes, he's coming again as judge. And one day he's going to appear and he's going to judge the world in righteousness. He's going to hold the world of humanity accountable. That is why there must be preparation for that moment in history. As we come to conclude on this Easter Sunday, are you prepared? Are you prepared for that day when we shall meet with Christ? Everyone will see him. Everyone will hear him. For some there will be gladness, but for others there will be terror. Are you prepared for that moment? I would appeal to you today to come to Christ, to seek him, to give him your life, to call upon his name for salvation. And be prepared. Come to this empty tomb. Rejoice in him. There is no hope apart from him. Let's bow for prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your word. We thank thee for this empty tomb. We pray you would bless your truth to every heart. For Christ's sake, amen.